Welcome to Trust the Journey. I'm Melanie Curtis. And I'm Jason Moletsky. <laughs> Thank you, legit, for joining us today. Now, our mission is living and learning, laughing and loving together with you. We're here to grow and contribute through our practice of openness, honesty, vulnerability, humility, and trust, trusting the entire journey. Yeah, and on that journey, we often talk about plant medicines, psychedelics, and other avenues of healing. When we do, we are sharing for informational purposes only. We're not doctors or therapists, and we don't promote doing anything illegal. Inside us all, we have a deep, powerful knowing. We encourage curiosity, healing, and exploration of this consciousness. Damn straight. Together, our handle is trustthejourney.today. Individually, you can find her at melaniecurtis.com and me at jasonmoletsky.com. Thank you all again so much for being with us. On to the show. Right on, fam. Okay, in today's episode, we are thrilled to welcome Anne Filippi. Born in Alsace, based in Berlin, Anne Filippi is a former author and reporter at Vanity Fair, GQ, and Vogue. She worked as a Silicon Valley correspondent for, here we go, Frankfurter Algemein Zuntung. I can't pronounce that. Basically, it's the New York Times of Germany. She's a very accomplished writer. She lived in Los Angeles for six years as a Hollywood reporter for GQ Germany. She wrote about the West Coast tech world in Silicon Valley. She discovered psychedelic-assisted therapy in 2019 and founded the New Health Club show podcast and newsletter. That created a space where people from the new psychedelic ecosystem and business world could talk about the disruptive power of psychedelics. By 2021, she was part of the 100 most important people in psychedelics and is part of the international psychedelic ecosystem and industry. Now, the New Health Club is working on introducing psychedelic tools back into society and culture and is creating new narratives, podcasts, and products around the new health that we need in our world. She is also working on a new foundation to look at intergenerational trauma and psychedelic healing modalities. Anne, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. It's, um, I always like to be on American podcasts. <laughs> yeah, totally. It's more crossing fun, mostly. The, cro crossing the proverbial pond. You know, I... I want to just jump right in if you're cool with that. Yeah. Your bio says that you discovered psychedelic psychedelic assisted therapies in 2019. And I'm curious what that story is. Like, how did you discover these healing modalities? Because obviously it seems like that was a pivotal moment in your life and your career that that made you seismically change directions in a really amazing, powerful way. And so I'm curious what your story is around that and you know take us there yeah I mean <clears throat> um, I think it started when I came back from Los Angeles back to Berlin and I realized that not only that I didn't want to be in media anymore because that would have been my natural choice but I also realized that there was something in me that I couldn't really name what it was and mm -hmm. sometimes this had raised his head in LA while I was doing Kundalini yoga um, every day which was way too much <laughs> but it was it brought stuff to the surface and um, but still I was very distracted by you know the celebrities in the Kundalini yoga and uh, it's a very interesting structure how this actually keeps you away from not really connecting to yourself and in the city I mm. found. So, but then back in Berlin, uh, I realized, wow, this is something is happening. And then as, as we often know, before people engage in psychedelics, you can't really tell what it is like, but you know, there is something. And then I really did another round of talk therapy. The first time I really got into a fight with a therapist because um, I felt like, I mean, it was probably my fault that we got into the fight because I was really <laughs> bored by myself just repeating the same story. 
and um, and then really somebody gave me the the Michael Pollan book. And in the beginning, I didn't even connect it to my like yeah to my own interest. But then I started as really started with the episode where he is looking into LSD, is and it? Um, then I closed the book and just tried to find a psychiatrist here in Berlin, uh, who have, which I found. And we had immediately like four, you know, preparation therapy sessions because he was um, a very educated and experienced psychiatrist and psychoanalyst. And I really knew I had to do something else. I, it was kind of, I'm yeah. not going to say it was desperate, but maybe it was more than I thought at the time and uh, so yeah and then one morning on Saturday morning other people go to the gym or to the farmer's market <laughs> I went to take LSD in this <laughs> kind of a therapy place or in his practice and um, pretty quickly after the onset I think like after half an hour I saw a life that was I think my happy life, but which was the absolute opposite of my life I actually had at the time. Wow. And so, um, and after this day, I mean, you know, it takes very long an LSD experience, like up, up to six hours. It wasn't like I thought like, oh, I have to, you know, cut out everything, need to stop everything. But something had changed in a way um, I, that I wanted to pursue this further. But then, and then since then, I think it was in May 2019, um, then in that summer, I'd met Christian Angermeyer because I did a story about him for this Frankfurter Allgemeine. <laughs> and, um, See, that's how you say it, everyone. Yeah, nobody needs to learn this, please. I mean, that's insane. And uh, so, and he really supported me very early on with the podcast because we had a lot of conversations about psychedelics and uh, but just the two of it, not you know not in a in a very private way like because it wasn't at the time it wasn't really out there yet that much mm -hmm. so and then in in the yeah in 2019 if i look back at it now like my life really started to transform but what i like about it is that it wasn't this you know you come home from an experience and you're like i have to rip everything apart I have to hate everybody now that I know but it was almost like I want to say sometimes I didn't have to do something it just happened things started to happen to me automatically and um, and then in 2020 I went the first time to, to the Netherlands and took a high dose of truffles at synthesis back then and pretty pretty much after like a week after I went to Nuremberg to meet David Bronner and we mm -hmm. started to a conversation that they would sponsor the podcast. And then suddenly, a year later, after the first LSD experience, my life was completely transformed without Amazing. me being like, you know, hunting it down for transformation, but it was. Wow. So. You know, I think what one thing that's amazing um, about your story and useful potentially for people who are listening is that how you said you were bored with yourself that you were bored hearing yeah. the same story mm -hmm. like we often think about psychedelic healing is like oh it has to be some deep unalterable pain that we are so upset about and i'm i'm sh those things are so so relevant and important as well but i like that invitation of i'm bored i'm um i don't i'm unfulfilled i don't know why i keep talking about the same story yeah that is just as relevant a reason to go toward healing as something that is rigorously painful. I love that. But I mean, of course, as we know, then once you start to engage in this, you, you realize that there is a lot of pain in you yes, that can correct. be shown to you as as extreme boredom or ex ex extreme... Yep. Like, I mean, as a journalist, it's always good to be very cynical because it makes you very successful as a journalist. Mm. But... um. It's just that I realized also at one point that's also why I would didn't want to be anymore in this at least German classic media world because the more yeah cynical you were or the more kind of condescending the more successful you were especially I have to say if you wrote about Hollywood because people didn't want to hear that a Hollywood person was 
interesting or great. They wanted to hear like how superficial they are. And then you were mm -hmm. really like, oh, I read your article. It was so great because you wrote how stupid Michael Douglas is or something, right? But I, <laughs> I stopped oh doing that. And then yeah. also my journalistic success became less because I started to not hate things anymore. So mm. it was also something wow. that happened. So you mentioned Michael Pollan's yeah. book. Was that your your opening to the whole concept and idea of exploring psychedelics? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, as everybody else here, I heard about it, and uh, I've never done psychedelics. I had a in my thirties, I had a very destructive relationship with a cocaine addicted trust fund baby from Miami, and I thought, like, well, this is how a relationship probably is. Mm, but this was my idea of drugs that was presented to me. Like you know, this is like a, a drug person that, and they and they all got put into a pile together. Exactly. The concept yeah. of all so, drugs. So and I didn't, this had no idea of, yeah. about yeah. you know that there's. I mean, really, like there was a big difference between, let's say, cocaine and LSD and mushrooms. I, I was totally uninformed because I've never done mm -hmm. it because I was always very terrified of it, but. Then with Michael Pollan, I mean, I think this is what a lot of people had that experience. It was such an accomplished writer. It was a writer. I could, you know, follow what he was, why he wanted, wanted to look into this. And uh, also the way he wrote about it was so kind of serious, but not too serious, but then also not too woo-woo-ish kind of. Yep. And um, yeah, so the way he wrote about, especially LSD for some reason, I felt like hmm, maybe this is something that is not so scary also. And then funny enough, one of the first podcasts we did was with Michael Pollan. And then he said like, um, <laughs> psychedelics are wasted on the young. And I was like, oh, wow, this is such a great guy. <laughs> I totally agree. And and suddenly it was this, I mean, you know how it is. America gives you, that's why I love it so much, I have to say it. It gives you this possibility of you can be open to many things. Not so much depending how old you are. Like in Europe, it's way more like, oh, yeah, you're already that old, so you shouldn't do this anymore. You should look like this anymore and so on. So, and he um he had a really great way to just reintroduce in that case, LSD is something that could actually um, yeah. just eventually help you to, yeah, to just take the a step that you couldn't maybe take otherwise. So, and it was, yeah, it was a great way of, yeah. of explaining what, what he did, I think. So I think there's something really interesting here in this topic of uh, kind of this age age genre yeah. relationship to when we explore our minds and when we stop exploring our minds. And we have this idea in culture that, you know, once we pass our thirties, our twenties are long behind mm -hmm. us and self-exploration, self-discovery is done. And we are now who we are and it's not safe to explore psychedelics or, you know, mind expanding chemicals into our forties or our fifties or even our sixties. And there's an interesting element here is that there's really low, low risk profile in LSD, psilocybin, any of these mm -hmm. um, psychedelics have have very low um, associated risks with, say, you know, a cardiac event or something that you might see from, say, a stimulant or a depressant. These other kinds of compounds that, that risk profile is not there. So what it means is these are available to people in midlife, in later life, to continue starting to flower and to bloom and explore who we are. Yeah, and I think like, um, I mean, reading Michael Pollan was one thing, but then through a very weird coincidence, I met Amanda Fielding also, like 2019, uh -huh. <laughs> I think, because I was seeing a guy that I met on a dating app and he looked like you Grant and, and I went to London and he was like, <laughs> it was really like that. He was like, do you want to go for lunch with Amanda Fielding? I was like, do you mean yeah. this Amanda Fielding? So he took me to lunch with her to her place in Beckley Park. And I mean, she was then, I don't know, like 75, maybe 76. And of course it was incredibly fascinating because she was speaking like a TED talk. She was like, her mind was 
on. And um, meeting with her was also something that was had a big influence on me because at one point we were sitting in her living room that looks like a Laura Canyon living room like from the 60s. And I don't know, the sun came in and I was like, so, okay, something is happening here. I don't really know what it's going oh. to be, but this person has a huge influence on me. And mm. um, after this, like, she even gave me advice. It was before the LSD trip. She gave me advice what I should do, like how much orange juice I should drink <laughs> with the LSD to make it work better. So and I was like, okay, like I've never done it. So <laughs> And um, then we became, I mean, we, we, we were writing emails once in a while and, uh, and then she came on a podcast. And But seeing her also exactly to your point was like, wow, she dedicated her life to this and um, that's what inspired me to do the same thing. Yeah, and uh, you know, and that's where I wanted to go next because you obviously have such a rich career in media and there can be this one singular narrow view of like this is what media looks Mm -hmm. like and I'm almost like it makes so much sense that your your experience in media would almost dovetail into something when you you discovered this like this calling this inspiration and so I would love to hear how you started the new health club show and tell us how that began what what did you do I mean not necessarily you can share pragmatically what you did it's not like we're trying to coach people on how to start a podcast but it's more like that idea that inspiration of where you took it and how it how it started and yeah, just tell us more about that. Yeah, I mean, I think, like, if you think back at 2019, I mean, the book had come out, the Michael Pollan book, which was in America a really big thing, not so much in Europe. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there had been research from Imperial College, from Robert Card Harris, but it was still like a nothing that people really knew about yet. So, and... Right. Um, when it started to become, let's say, like a hot thing, like psychedelic startups, for example. But what I realized at the time, and this is also a conversation I had with, with Christian in the beginning, is that there was actually not really a language for this because it was was either or either like a a very medical way of talking about it or a very scientific way, which most people wouldn't really understand. I mean even though I don't get everything if, if I listen to a very scientific talk on some conferences. Or the other way was an extremely kind of, you know, kind of woo-woo way of talking about it. And just pers- people who had one ayahuasca experience suddenly looked at themselves as a, as a shaman. All of this kind of, you know, these two extremes, Ugh. you could say. Yeah. And um, so... And being at Conde Nast for, I mean, quite a bit, I realized, wow, what about if you really try to do a show around this and talk to these really incredible people like scientists, um, investors, um, therapists, I mean, legends like Rick Doblin or Amanda, in a way as if they would be interviewed by, I don't know, CNN or... um, Maybe mm-hmm. it was a, like what's what's the what's the great night nightlife show, um, nighttime show, um, yeah, Nightline. They, they, <laughs> no, no, this had like this one guy. Of course, I always forget to say him. It's not it's not Bill Maher, but um, that, that kind Letterman. of show, right? I mean, like where you have <laughs> other questions. It's also not Letterman. No. Um, he's very this um, kind of. He's very nasty sometimes, I, I think. It's so, so keep ga- guessing a million things. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so, but I mean, like, I realized, that, so there's no, and let, let's call it entertainment factor to it, which means, and I'm, I'm a big fan of entertainment, because it actually means that people will listen and start to understand what you're talking about. So, and right. um, without being maybe entertained, but they still would listen because they are entertained. And um, I'm not saying that all of these interviews were really, you know, like super funny or like, I mean, some topics are not super funny that are dealt with in in psychedelics. But for example, I remember the podcast with Deborah Mash 
um, and she's like a really interesting researcher for ibogaine. And um, so the way she talked about how they researched ibogaine in the 80s, 90s in her lab in Miami, it was like, it was like super, like like a movie almost. Like, And then she said, yeah, and then we found a third molecule and we call it the Miami Vice molecule. And I was like, oh my God, like I can't stop. You have to tell me everything about this. And it became really fascinating. All right. these scientist stories, like, I mean... Like as we know, in the eighties and nineties, it wasn't like the cool thing. It was very difficult. Or with Rick kind of doing psychedelics with Stan Groff and Essel and all of these stories that we also have to, you know, kind of hear today. That because nobody kind of asked those people about these stories and at the time. So yeah, the, so what I did and what I tried and. Weirdly enough, supported it through the pandemic because we could do like a like a Zoom uh, show because everybody had time and everybody could do Zoom, but it looked kind of stylish. So and um, so I tried to really create like a very good looking show about mm-hmm. <laughs> right and uh, also a show that people could really understand and actually would also see what incredible work these people. Um, we're doing some, you know, as you know, sometimes 30, 40 years without being recognized for anything. And now we all profit from them, basically. Yeah. That's what I did. Yeah. It's a, it, there's a, there's a yeah. lot of inspiration in what's come from these, these psych- underground psychedelic yeah. leaders, yeah. right? Stan Grov, for example, Rick Dalvin, of course, you know, there's just a, there's a long list of these scientists and advocates and personal explorers it's so great that they're finally getting some recognition yeah. and having a stage to come out on whether it's on podcasts like this or yours or on the psychedelic sciences conference there's now there's there's multiple platforms mm-hmm. around the world where these are happening it's uh it's about time yeah it is yeah. it is <laughs> um well very cool that your show exists Again, obviously, <laughs> our you. show is similar in the sense that we're like, how can we amplify yeah. voices? How can we amplify stories? What are the healing experiences that we have all had, right? If we don't have the scientific evidence, body of evidence that we need for legal change or or these types of things yet, but we're working toward it, how can we fill the zeitgeist with stories and anecdotal evidence of people's lives being utterly transformed by this work, by this healing work. And so that's a big reason why we exist is is for that reason, which makes me want to ask more about your own healing journey. You know, like what else contributed to your, I mean, we could talk about psychedelics all day. And if it's Mm. more psychedelics, maybe ayahuasca, maybe this, I don't know what you've done, what experiences you've had. Um, Maybe there are other modalities that you've engaged in that have yeah. been a part of your healing, ex- you know, journey, your healing experiences, because that's partly what we want to share here too. Yeah, I mean, I started with, I mean, LSD almost like accidentally, but I thought it was incredible. It's actually time to do it again, maybe. <laughs> it's, it's calling. It's calling <laughs> but, your name. Um, <laughs> perfect. But, perfect. After this, I did truffles in the Netherlands. Mm-hmm. And um, okay. I think this is when the real journey actually began because mm-hmm. in these in this particular truffle journey with synthesis back then, it was at the end of the trip and and often like... Can we clarify sure. for the audience that truffle journey is a, psilo- psilocybin. It's a psilocybin, psilocybin. Big yes, yeah. yeah, it's just that in, they call truffles yeah. in in the in the Netherlands, but I mean they are mushrooms yeah. basically. Mm-hmm. So and um, in in this journey, roughly two or three weeks later, which was already in the pandemic, so in this very weird time, anyway, I found out or like my brain remembered that I had had a very, very, very serious childhood trauma at the age of seven which I had forgotten for probably 30 years. Yeah. So, and, um, or like this this weird thing where somebody would tell you, oh, you remember when this and this happened to you? But 
that's you might want to think about it but then even you would say yeah but that's so long ago and they're like whatever who okay. cares it wasn't that bad but it was really bad and mm -hmm. um <clears throat> and then this was the first step of me f like remembering this thing and then because it was the pandemic you couldn't leave the country and um <clears throat> sorry and um so I found a ketamine treatment in Berlin because I wanted to keep working on, on my kind of insight. So it was, uh, the streets were empty. I drove every Tuesday in an Uber to a ketamine clinic. <laughs> it's amazing. I have to, I mean, it sounds almost like, like a Hollywood movie again. But um, it was very interesting because it was almost like, okay, this is the future. You're just going every Tuesday to a ketamine treatment to work on your stuff. Mm -hmm. And this helped me even work around further with the topic. And then when it was possible again to, to go back to the Netherlands, I did, I think, another two truffle experiences. And mm -hmm. uh, it brought me to the topic of not having children and why that was and that it was actually really something that I regretted. So... And I could never really access the feeling of regretting it. Not regretting mm -hmm. in a sense that, you know, that I would have a depression because of this, but I realized that it meant actually a lot to me. So and, right. um, that allowed me to, to, this insight allowed me to maybe find things that would replace this. And in my trips, I always have children. It's like mm -hmm. in every trip I have, I have children. So that was also very interesting to see. So I worked on that for quite a while. And um, then last, I think in, in, su in summer 22, uh, I was part of a study from, um, from an American university with a, where it was really about a very high dose of psilocybin, higher than usual. And um, Can you clarify how much that uh, was for, 40, for our audience? 40 milligram truffles so, so for, that's for yeah but for me grams, it was very yeah. high so for other people it's like whatever yep. but <laughs> for yeah. me it was high and uh, high for me so too it was i mean it was it was the first experience of a total ego death and this trauma thing came really back like really like as a visual but the first time in a way that it could like let it go and not pay attention i mean pay attention to it but it was suddenly it was gone in the trip um, but that year after this experience was the year, and that talking about 2023, where if I want to make it short, I really had no idea who I was anymore be without the trauma. And I had many moments where I was like, this person would do this, this other person would do this. And it was quite a weird year because of that. And I think this is also part of your healing journey that you you have to reinvent another person almost. Yeah. Because the traumatized person doesn't engage in certain things anymore, doesn't have certain friendships anymore, doesn't have certain relationships anymore, and so on. And um, of course, I also, you know, realize, well, this, so now, so now I also have this information and I need to let it go also out of my system and body, which brought me to the insight that I had quite a bit of a PTSD um, kind of, I had moments where I realized I have PTSD reactions, yeah, which I yeah. never had thought of before. Like, for example, very simple, if I would be in a subway in Berlin, like I would be super nervous suddenly people coming close to me, although they really? were just standing like because it was full. And I, right. I, I never knew why I was so like how you call it aggregated like annoyed yeah, like your body would be activated yeah, and I was like, they don't do anything that, yeah. they just and so suddenly it was like wait oh this is also maybe connected to this trauma thing and yeah. then in november last year i did the first round of um of an mdma therapy uh which is which i will continue with a kind of a little bit like the maps protocol with two therapists and to be yep. quite honest i think this was to me really a big step because I felt like the truffles had brought me the information and had me remembered what was important to me, what also what had happened to me. And the MDMA delivered 
and I mean, it just did the first round. It delivered the a very interesting form of freedom from this experience and from this thing. And uh, again, like the first weeks where I was really exhausted, my body was like letting go everything. And then at one point it was like, okay, now it's time for the new person. That's <laughs> It was really interesting yeah. how this PTSD elements that I had were just disappearing. At least I was aware of them suddenly. So yeah, that's my own uncharted, journey. Yeah. The uncharted territory of becoming the new person. Before we go there, I just want to thank you for sharing that. Really, for you're all welcome. that you sharing, you're sharing and, and touch on the not having children thing. Because that's very res resonant and present for me as an individual right now, mm -hmm. where only because of my experiences with plant medicines and de healing deeply and going into places and spaces in myself where I could actually feel the deep sadness in my body and actually cry, 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 and just get all of that be allowed to feel we joke on the podcast a lot. Jay mentions it a lot about how I had, I've, I've said, I am not afraid of my feelings. And that's only because I've had to go to my feelings and, and really be with them. And I had the safe space in which to do that. Why I talk about that is to r relate it to this, this current experience of like me, me looking at, because I'm 46 years old. Theoretically, I could still have a child like my body functions, yeah. but it's a, it's a, you know, the end is near, you know what I mean? And it's a thing. It's a real thing for women. Not all women want children. They feel very clear about it. But I do think that it's a, a shared pain that a lot of us have to work through for people who maybe didn't choose it or didn't end up that way or that having that experience in their life. Anyway, I point to that because I hope it resonates for people listening, but also that for me, it was a thing where like I could feel the, oh God, I'm a little afraid to even look at this because mm -hmm. I'm going to be fucking sad about it. You know what I mean? Where I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, I don't even want to go there because I'm going to feel so fucking sad and there won't be anything I can do about it. You know, so it's like been a brave step for me to even start looking at that and start talking about it. So I appreciate you sharing that that piece on top of the other stuff. So yeah, that's all. But I mean, how Mel, so the part you're talking about right now with yeah. the the sadness, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And this there's a stigma in culture that only positive emotions should be allowed. Correct. It's true. Right. That we, and so we have this compartmentalization that happens when there's scary, hard, painful, sad, anything that's in this like negative profile of emotion, we're, we're kind of taught to like compartmentalize it all and push it down or not feel it, not allow it. And I feel like, and what you were saying there about how the trauma informs us in a subconscious way where we're like, we start to block out parts of who we are based on the experiences that we've had. And we're like, okay, I, now that I've had this, you know, hard experience, which I haven't processed, I have never allowed it to occur. Yeah. It's now putting me in a box of what I do allow into my life and what I don't allow in. And I love how you touched on how certain psychedelics, um, ones that are kind of this openers, uh, say, a masculine or LSD or a psilocybin or an ayahuasca it might open up our mind to an idea of changing our perspective on them. And what you said about how MDMA, wh when you started that therapy, I can deeply relate to this in the sense that um, from my own experience, I encountered psilocybin and LSD long before MDMA came along. And they allowed me to expand my vision. They allowed me to say, oh, wow, I could see this differently. I could see this as a, as a gift, or I could see this as like a, this was actually for me in a way where I'm supposed to learn from it, but I don't know how to integrate. It. I don't know how to allow it because my body's never had the chance to be okay with these things. Mm -hmm. And then the MDMA comes along and says, you know what? 
it's all okay. Right. It's all uh-huh. okay. And right. We, we're able to love that part of ourself. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also like, I mean, so, I remember there was this one party at Wonderland, uh, one of the conferences. And I mean, it was, you know, how it is in Miami. It was warm. It was 4 a.m. at night. It was a really nice party. The whole community was there. And I realized, wow, I always had this very bad feeling around nightlife although I was out a lot here in Berlin because it was always like connected to dramatic kind of events or people got into you know like it was it had kind of a very negative destructive flavor and uh, then this one night I mean it was I think it was 21 probably to 22 thank you for listening If you're receiving value from this episode, we would love it if you would show your support for the show by subscribing on YouTube, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts, and follow us on Instagram. You can click the like button, leave us a comment, or share the podcast with somebody directly. Every month, we host integration coaching circles. These are safely held spaces for those looking to heal, grow, and connect in community. They are beautiful alive. So much good work is happening. You are invited to join us. Go to trustthejourney.today slash integration. You can join the Trust the Journey family, which includes these integration coaching circles and our private Facebook group where we connect and support each other. Sign up by going to our website, trustthejourney.today, obviously, and (laughs) click on the orange Patreon button. Now, it's your support and engagement that make the show possible. We love connecting with you. So feel free to DM us anytime on Instagram with your thoughts at trustthejourney.today. And now I'm back to our regularly scheduled programming. And Sandy, I was like, wow, this is how it feels when there's a community that is enjoying each other and it is a an in, in, in incredible joy around this dance floor and everybody likes each other. I mean, of course, people had done psychedelics, but, yeah. but still, I mean, it was such a game changer for me to perceive myself also different in a situation like this, where before it was like, oh, you know, kind of the longer the night went on, the more problems arose between couples and People got divorces Mm -hmm. after these, you know, wild years in Berlin and all of this. And suddenly it was like, wow, this feels very different. It feels, and also I felt very different. And this is the first time where I realized that this is actually the feeling without the trauma. So this is the comparison between a night fueled by depressants and stimulants versus a night fueled or an evening fueled yeah. by, you know, mind expanding <laughs> yeah. Yeah, heart, yeah, heart opening, stuff like that. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. Wow, beautiful. I mean, I think it's an interesting thing, the, the concept, the part of the conversation of, okay, now what does it look like for me to be and step into and bring intentionality to being this new person? without this trauma, with this healing, acknowledging that it is unusual and will feel strange, not necessarily bad to your point. Strange. You're having yeah. a yeah, strange, unusual because we've never experienced it in our adult uh, consciousness. Is there what do have you brought to your own integration? You know what I mean? Like what has mm. your integration looked like? You're having these it, it, these aha moments, these insights, the the recognition of this change in you, are you, how are you amplifying that or, or uh, you know, just bringing intentionality to it so that it grows and your mind continues to open and your life experience continues to open in these ways that you're enjoying? Yeah, and I think the biggest, it's interesting you ask that because the biggest exercise that comes out of this for me and even more with MDMA is to give up independence. And um, that kind of independence that is connected to PTSD, which was often very handy as a reporter and journalist. I was on the way also to become a war reporter at one point. I I volunteered for this. 
So which wow. means like you disconnect from pretty much everything. And so um, so what I'm doing now is, and, and I think this is where the MDMA specifically supported me. And again, like I have another two sessions to go, but so this, so what happens if I don't act like a, like an uber independent person? Right. So, which is probably how human beings are. No, you know, people are dependent on each other. But here's the thing for me, I needed to find a difference between being codependent yep. and being connected to people. So my big task is to f to work on a daily basis or to, to observe also on a daily basis what is connection and what is codependency and mm, uh, what, what is this uber um, de yeah, in independency like... Um, I basically I can do everything by myself. Which, funny enough, as we know in the pandemic, at one point we learned we kind of we can't do anything alone. And then at right. the same time, I started a podcast alone. I was like, yeah, see, you can do it. You can do, do this alone. <laughs> but now, so you know, the, we, we're back in a different situation. I really, really try with everything I do, also connected to the podcast, connected to the to the next steps that we're working on um, to to actively seek support and ask people for help. But not help like, you know, like annoying help, like <laughs> like real, real support um, that is also interesting for them or where they say, oh God, I'm so happy to support you in this. So, and um, and actually I have very good friends in New York that I just stayed with and so they were like, you can stay as long as you want. I was like, yeah. And you, they were like, you can stay as long as you want. Yeah, so, right. And we're so, going to get through the independent yeah. wall. Right. And it was, it's very, very <laughs> funny with them because we have this, you know, conversation about this. Um, so, but this is to me, this is the biggest, I don't know, the, the, the for me personally, the biggest achievement to really say like I'm not independent and I don't want to be it's boring it's exhausting I don't it doesn't it's not also not a lot of fun so this is my daily practice do you think this is a separation from our ego mind yeah right like too. I think yeah. in modern culture one of the things that we're again we're taught by society is to be this individual, to be an ego, right? Where it's all about self and how yeah. strong or how yeah. independent, how how can it resilient can I be? And this whole concept, I think psychedelics, thank you, psychedelics, for yeah. pulling down these walls of <laughs> we're all connected. We're all on this journey together. We're all one big experience that is happening. And even right now, this simple act of sharing of leaning into a story and saying, Hey, I thought I was this, but actually I'm not this tearing down of the wall of ego and opening allows others to feel safe to peer over their own wall yes, right? yeah. and to go, maybe I could take a few bricks out of this wall too, you know? Yeah. And it's like, even, even in the beginning in a podcast when, you know, when I didn't meet anybody because of the pandemic and people just listened to the podcast, a lot of people were writing yeah, because you were talking about this in the show or like because you were saying that you had trauma and you were looking for ways to go through it. Um, I was actually also feeling like, hmm, okay, maybe I can do that too. Or like I, I just met this um, really amazing, like a, a guy who has a really big law firm here who wants to do an event with us. And he was like... Um, introducing himself like very serious from Harvard and he was like and I also have anxiety <laughs> it was really funny because it was like right. the second thing and I'm said. human Harvard yeah. Harvard but also Harvard anxiety, and, anxiety. <laughs> and I was like this is so great I love this that he was so you know he said that and he was like very relieved yeah. that he could say it that yes it wasn't like oh don't tell me about Harvard but not about your anxiety kind of right Oh, yeah, it's this notion of being a whole person. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like, uh, yeah, go ahead, Jay, Jay, go ahead. It looks like you have a thought. Yeah, it's so It's so much easier to connect to each other and to yeah. feel okay with being ourselves if we take the, the armor off mm -hmm. right away at the beginning of the conversation. You know, I was just in a 
a very serious couple days of business uh, retreat and we had a facilitator and we're working hard on, you know, working through the next steps and the development of this business. And, and one of the practices we were doing, which was super helpful was like, before we even start a sentence or say, the story I'm telling myself right now is, and say, uh, I feel like you're probably going to reject what I'm about to say, but here's what I'm about to say. And, and as soon as we put that yep. piece out there that, that takes down and says, there's what, here's the story I'm, you know, that I'm living in right now. Then everybody else goes, well, yeah, I'm living in a story right now too. Guess what? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I feel human. I feel connected. Yeah, yeah totally. And go ahead. Sorry. Cut you off. No, no. I mean, and, um, it's interesting. Like once you, I mean, it's almost like, I think like you have this little game with yourself. Yeah. You, know, you go into situations that you know from your past. I mean, I'd just been to a, a 60th birthday of my one of my best friends and um, a lot of people from my media past were there and I mean it's, it's nice to see them but the whole night I was thinking why was I in this world what what did I want yeah. to do there what was I looking yeah. for and not like you know to hate myself that I was there because of course I was at least in LA I was in Hollywood um, but still it was something that now to me would be very foreign to to be in like um yeah to be yeah. In, in in a classic journalist's position and um so and that is always very interesting to put yourself into situations that seem to be your life or like <laughs> um familiar yeah. to you and then you're like hmm I don't want to be here. Yeah. <laughs> so, Jay, so. Jay and I have talked about that a lot. We have a lot okay. of gratitude and a lot of uh, awareness now because both of us are, we're professional skydivers at the world level. Oh, like wow. we're highly accomplished professional athletes mm -hmm. in, in skydiving and extreme sports. And so it's, it's a thing to now be very deeply immersed in our own healing journeys and and reflect what brought us to those spaces and be grateful for how it saved us in many respects early on because it gave us a at least somewhat healthier avenue for addictive tendencies and mm -hmm. necessary and needed uh, a connection with other people in community so it's like it's interesting because i feel very 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 differently about my relationship to skydiving as a sport mm -hmm. but also my i feel very differently about my relationship to the community even though I have deep gratitude but like I also am like I don't want to go hang out at the drop zone and do a bunch of jumps anymore that's just not where I'm at in my life and I'm okay with that too but I think that's a very normal thing to move forward from the things that used to define us that used to consume our lives yeah it's a it's a thing <laughs> It is, Sam. Yeah. I've, I've had a conversation with a good uh, mutual friend of ours, Mel, yeah. this morning. I was talking um, with Kara yeah. about this exact topic where like, we look back at versions of ourself at previous chapters in our lives. And as I'm almost like, I almost don't even recognize them myself. Oh, yeah. I'm like, who is the person who in is that, that story before the latest transformation or the latest timeline jump where we've shifted? from one version of ourself to a new version of ourself. And now that old energy, that old vibration, it just isn't us anymore. It, it's who we used to be, mm -hmm. but it's, it's just not who we are. But, but what I found really fascinating is that this is exactly the moment for, to me, to the connection to longevity, because I feel like once the bunch of trauma stones have come off your I don't know, system or soul or body. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm able to experience like, um, I don't know, like, like uh, excitement, joy and obsession, like in a positive way with things that yeah. I did not really have before. Like, and I can connect also with people in a very different way. Like, I mean, suddenly I remember like how often, even on parties where I was, where I knew everybody, I was, I could never like attach to a group and have a conversation, which means I was obviously very dis much dissociating mm -hmm. without knowing at the time, of course, that I did that. But what I remembered is that I was like, I couldn't connect to a group even if I knew the people. So, um, and, and I find now in this, once you 
start to realize that, okay, this is a part of you that was trauma that might have left your body also at, at some point, or you're on the way to kick it out. <laughs> so, yeah, totally. Um, well, it's, you know, and it shows up so, big in big ways and, and little ways, right? You know, we can see those big seismic shifts of I don't yeah. even recognize myself anymore. And I literally just told my partner this this morning. I said to him, I was like, I because I used to feel we had we recently moved in together, not even six oh, months ago. Okay. And I was feeling a lot of anxiety just being in our home. You know, just like, oh, Oh, I'm a little nervous to just be around and I'm not taking up too much space, like just stuff that was Mm -hmm. in my uh, in my body. And uh, there's no reason for me to feel that really theoretically. And so anyway, I just recently came back from uh, my last three day ayahuasca ceremony and worked a lot on deep, deep stuff. And anxiety was the main intention was why do I feel this sort of deeper undertone of anxiety? I'm going to leave that there as a teaser for future episodes. I'm not going to go into the giant share (laughs) around that. But I just told Ken this morning, I was like, I don't feel that anxiety in our home anymore. I feel perfectly fine sitting here, being around you, talking to you, not talking to you. It's an it's a notable shift and it seems small. But that was like a it's like one of those real life impacts that in my world is very obvious. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd like to ask you a question. Sure. I'd like to know what is exciting you right now. Like what is in the future in your mind? Like what's inspiring you? What's on your play? Where are you going? And now that you've had these, you know, previous versions of self, you're looking back at the, you know, the, the, the versions that are no longer you, Mm -hmm. what does the future version of yourself look like? What do you see yourself doing? What's important? Yeah. I mean, the, the first thing is really like, um, starting very meaningful collaborations with people that I met in the last couple of, maybe the last year, like for example, the people who run Neuer house in New York. So we we're planning a really big event there together more about this soon with other also great collaborators so this is the one thing I'm really looking actively for people that help me to make the the show bigger like the the way more also more professionalized how to run a newsletter and you know all of these technical things that I realize if I engage other people um it's a really good idea and, and I really feel how fast these things are growing. So, so this is one thing that is very exciting for me. And um, so, but I personally have two major excitements. So the, the one thing is really to almost, I almost feel like I'm going on a world tour with the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so, cool. <laughs> specifically doing that. events in New York. Um, probably at Neue House. Maybe guess somewhere who's else too. coming. <laughs> you, you guys have to come. And uh, <laughs> then um, same with LA. And then I just started a collaboration also. Like, uh, thankfully, I was um, able to be part, or I'm able to be part of the new foundation from the Imperial College in London um, that is kind of looking into art and science and how art and science and culture could support psychedelic research. So we're just working on a couple of events. Um, Super exciting to me because, I mean, I think the Imperial College is one of the great universities for this. And a lot of my friends are there now, like Tommaso Barba and David Arizzo. And uh, then Berlin, of course, is also under radar where we do something with Fotografiska, which is also connected to Neuer House. So I really, really like the idea of creating as much physical meetings with people and kind of community meetings and live podcasts as possible because this is always when the greatest things are happening new connections are being built and people really can exchange their experiences or just kind of meet other people that are that they can talk to about their healing journey and they don't need to feel weird because they are just right. have done a trip or something so yeah. this is something that I'm really really excited about and the second one that really came out 
also of the last couple of months. But if I'm honest, it started when I was 12 years old because my parents, my mother and my stepdad, they were thinking really hard to move to Israel when I was 12. And we lived two months in a kibbutz and they wanted to become teachers. And I was really excited to live in a kibbutz. And then we had to go back to Germany. Um, they didn't make that decision. But for some reason, I felt a very strong connection to this culture. And maybe also then, of course, at one point I realized, well, Germans obviously have a responsibility to look into this thing that they, you know, created, like the Holocaust. Right. So it right. And, since since I was that age, it always came back to me in school and in very different variations. And then when I started to psychedelic experience in, in many trips I, ha I did, um, the topic came back to me where in my trip I was in a concentration camp, not as an inmate or like a Nazi, but... I was there. I was observing everything. I was looking at everything. So, and I had a lot of conversations w about this with Rachel Yehuda, who was doing research mm. about this. And of course, Rick Doblin in the podcast, we talked about this, which was a very important moment for me no. to talk to, to these two people about this because I realized, yeah. wow, this is in all Germans or in all people, especially Germans, is this trauma too that they have created this, um, I don't even know how to call it, like um, mass extermination. Right. And, uh, but also um, they still can't take, they don't seem to be able to take responsibility because they can't do it because they can't look into their trauma. They become, Germans become very angry if you mm. try to talk to them about this. So long story mm. short, I realized because of the psychedelic engagement and experiences, I realized that this is a really, really strong thing. And then, of course, October 7th happening, it's getting a round of re-traumatization. So wow. that's why we're just looking into um, preparing to open a foundation um, mm -hmm. around intergenerational trauma and how psychedelics could probably support a healing process with this. And it will start with the question around the Jewish community because it is just a community that I seem to be in. Mm. And in psychedelics, there are also a lot of people from that community that I am have become really good friends with, and but even before. so, And for some reason, I feel this is something I'd really like to bring into the, into the public and... For the first time, I also I feel very, I mean, I want to say confident to do this because I know I experienced by myself that it was something that was also in me, still kind of working in me. And I, to be quite honest, I still don't know if I'm Jewish myself. I'm still in the process of finding out. Yeah. But that doesn't matter so much. I think the most important thing is that psychedelics showed me that this is something that people can actually eventually use as a, a healing tool. And just a couple of days ago, I did a podcast that's going to come on next week with a foundation called a Safe Heart, kind of mm -hmm. a big foundation in the meantime in Israel, who helps the victims of the rave, you know, that the people who got attacked by Hamas at the rave. And so how... And as you know, they were some of them were doing psychedelics because they were on a rave. So eventually they were attacked while being on a trip. So mm. and of course, it's almost like they need some extra, very specific care because it can be such an incredible moment where they might see intergenerational visuals, where they see, right. I don't know, like other things that, seem to be like oh it's not so bad I'm just getting attacked I'm just gonna run like so it's such a weird setup but at the same time this organization is really doing exactly this what we should do with psychedelics like really helping people to get over something that they probably would not be able to even touch on like in the months to come 
So, and, and if I see that, what they're doing, I feel even more secure in myself to really open this foundation because it is really something that is also bothering me, if I can say this, in terms of Germany because the right-wing party is on the rise. And of course, then most people say, yeah, but that's over the world. But it is all over the world. But it is something else in Germany because it has this deep-rooted trauma that people really don't want to look into. So we really need psychedelics for Germany, I guess. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. thank, thank you. you so much for bringing it this specific topic because intergenerational trauma and lineage healing yeah. and repairing our DNA mm -hmm. and actually going into who we are on the spiritual level and digging deep into our souls and looking at where the pains lie that are not ours, but our, our mother and yes. fathers, mm -hmm. our grandmother and grandfathers, and our great grandmothers and great grandfathers' pains. These are passed down through our DNA, whether we like it or not. And it's our responsibilities to step up and say, I'm carrying this pain and this trauma and it expresses itself through the way that I am and the way that I act and how I receive. And it's on us to do the work, to fix those parts of ourselves that are still in pain and give them a, a place to be to be heard and felt and healed. So, wow, thank you. But I mean, you. also yeah. it's interesting that without these trips, I mean, another example, like, I mean, I, I was kind of really interested in this topic always and like also because we almost moved to Israel, but I mean, also because I felt like so many other topics we talked about, like it, I felt something in my body that was connected to this topic And then right in the first uh, psilocybin trip at, uh, in, in the Netherlands back then, it was pretty early on in a trip that in the trip I walked with a rabbi through Auschwitz and we had a conversation. And wow. so, and, um, but as you know, in a trip you have a very different conversation <laughs> than you would have in a, if you meet a real rabbi and you walk with him through Auschwitz, you don't have a conversation. You're just probably not going to say anything. So, right. And suddenly in these trips. It's a deep knowing. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's the deep knowing. Yeah, it's like you would not say, experience. hey, how was your it's day? A, like, you know, you would not have a conversation. It's transcendental, exactly. right? It's happening through a transfer of consciousness. So, and, and yeah. then in all of these trips, I, I mostly had experiences that made me, um, I mean, you could say like a witness, like an observant. And I even had in the, in the podcast with Gabo Mate, I talked to him about this. And he said to me like, yeah, maybe this is your worst idea of confinement to live mm. in, in a concentration camp. And there was something to it. But in the last year, I realized, no, no, there, there's really more to it. It is really like there is this responsibility for, from this generation my generation to kind of cut this intergenerational um, burden and to really have people being sad about that Germany has created the Holocaust and not just, mm -hmm. well, let's get angry because I can't hear anything about it anymore. So just a conversation is very, I mean, I'm not going to say it's easy for me now, but I can have the conversation now. It's powerful. So, It's powerful. I I listened to the episode with Gabor Mate, the the one that you're referencing. Yeah. It's a yeah. really uh, excellent episode. I think something that you're pointing to also that's really important relative to healing, relative to intergenerational trauma, relative to our own growing self awareness, is this idea that things will recur, yeah. and we will yeah. automatically dismiss and or undervalue those messages. Oh, that's not about me. I didn't live through that. Oh, that's not mine. Oh, oh, it's that's not really anything. But then for you to be like, oh, wow, it actually, there's more to this than I realized. It, that is a very common refrain for people doing deeper healing work and certainly heal, deeper healing work with psychedelics is like, this kept coming up, this because it might not be the ceremony to address X, Y, Z thing, but mm -hmm. X, Y, Z thing keeps coming up. And it's like, okay, when am I going to, oh, I'm going to actually look at X, Y, Z thing. And I'm going to just sort of broadly look, looking at it. But that's what I feel like I hear you describing in, in this. And it's a, it's a big deal. And now you're, 
founding a foundation to look into intergenerational yeah. trauma. This is a big deal. And I yeah. Thank acknowledge you. you for the persistence around a thought that you originally would have dismissed. Yeah, I mean, also like, I mean, you know how it is. You kind of, I mean, you, you see, you have the same reaction. Like you, like I remember in school, you had the topic came in very various, um, you know, like in in German class, in, in history class, in religion. Like it was always like in every part of the school, the topic was addressed to the point where I remember this very well. Like people in my school were saying, like, oh God, I can't listen to it anymore. It's just like, okay, yeah. I, I get the message now. It was really bad. So, and, right. um, but then like you want to put it away and say like, well, I mean, this is long time ago like you say it's long time ago it wasn't me it's not my fault but it's in your body unfortunately right but so, it's still there it's still yeah. there yeah so mm. this is what this yeah, is there's there's these layers it, it doesn't it, you know some uh, trauma like the holocaust which is affected the entire planet of course right? we're it talking did. about yeah. a scale sure. of an incident sure. where every single person on earth has had an effect of yeah. this and then there's like that's the macro and then on the micro we have our individual what we might call smaller traumas, right? Something that's more specific to us that we've had an individual experience, but we have these same reactions to them where we're like, yeah, that what that happened. And now I'm just going to put it on a shelf mm -hmm. and I'm going to not think about it anymore. And I'm like, oh, it's, it's not affecting me. Yeah. I'm telling myself this story that it's not affecting me anymore because I've put it on a shelf and I've managed to at least put, you know, some kind of distance between myself and whatever it might be. But it does not mean that we've healed it yet. And I love where we're going with this conversation and the work that you're doing in respect to the fact that we're going to go back and pick these items off of our proverbial shelf and look at them more deeply and say, where do we still have work to do around this? And how can I, how can we as a people and as an individual start be making this more commonplace of a conversation that we need to continue returning to our points of pain until they are no longer a pain and they're a lesson and they're something we can be yeah. grateful for have learned. And I mean, as you, I mean, of course, in America, this, there are other intergenerational topics, you know, like, as we know, but so many, and so every, many. every, every oh, nation, yeah. country, I mean, although, I mean, America is also quite a bit affected by the Holocaust. Like, I just had this conversation with a friend of mine from Switzerland and he was a Jew from Europe and he was like oh in, in Europe there's anti-Semitism so I'm not I'm going to America because it's great there's no anti-Semitism then October 7th happens and he's like well mm -hmm. I thought I would be okay here but now the thing is coming back to me so it's a very interesting kind of new insight a new way of looking at things that I think it's it's one of the biggest tasks the psychedelic community can have is to really deliver these kind of new ways of looking at things and I just had also in New York I had a conversation with Carl Hart and um, podcast and uh, so we, we same thing like I mean even if you would say like yeah I'm Carl Hart I'm this super cool professor in Colombia it wouldn't be possible because his whole story is always with him so mm -hmm. and so is it so it's the thing with Germans. It's like they have to acknowledge that they were doing this. So yeah. it's just very interesting to me. Well, Anne, I love uh, everything that we've been talking about today. As we head toward closing, I yeah. want to ask a lighter question um, about, because I think part of it, Part of what we want to do here, too, is, yeah, amplify amplify voices that are already out there, that are already in the conversation. And another thing that we want to do is be examples for people who want to, quote unquote, come out of the psychedelic closet and enter the conversation. Maybe they don't have a platform. Maybe they don't think they're anybody. Maybe they think their voice yeah. won't make a difference or all the You know, there's plenty of people that, you know, of us that maybe were in those those shoes at, at one point. What advice or what what would you say to somebody who's listening who's like, man, I really want to 
be out there with the fact that I believe in this or I want to share more of my healing journey to be in service? What would you say to those people? And again, it's not necessarily that they're wanting to start a podcast. Maybe it's they just want to start talking to their families or they yeah, want to yeah. open a conversation with their partner or whatever. What I mean, would you say to that? I, I, what I, now that I hear, what I hear talking, I, I, what came to my mind was this really great initiative, Drugs Over Dinner. Um, oh. maybe, maybe you guys know this. Um, it's kind of an initiative that you can actually download, um, let's say, a paper on, on their website with a couple of guidelines if you wanted to have a dinner with your friends or your family and start a conversation on drugs, meaning in, in wow. our case, psychedelics. And I thought this is such a great idea to just starting with your, I mean, if it's possible, with your family. And I think uh, people who are on a longer journey, they quite a bit, I mean, they, most of them had at one point told parents and I know, bigger other parts of the family. So, and it's, I found it always interesting that hardly anybody was saying, oh, it was a really bad idea to say this. I mean, of course, in the beginning, it might have been a little weird, but even I can say that um, when I started to talk to about, about this to my mother, so um, she wasn't even saying like, oh, this is super weird. She started to talk to her friends about ketamine therapy uh, that's what that's the first thing she did and then also like who's her best friend whose children one of her, their daughters was taking SSRIs forever and so she was kind of opening a conversation with her friend about her daughter that she might want to look into other things so I think it's it's a really interesting experiment to talk to your family first in a, in a completely new way um and and this drugs over dinner thing, it's actually it's a super nice idea and, and great support to download the PDF and then just have a conversation about drugs over dinner. Um I so love this that. is one thing. And um but I mean then again, I mean, why not starting a podcast? I mean, today it's mm -hmm. the great thing is today it's so easy to put out content. I mean, there's so many tools compared to even like five years ago, I feel newsletters for free, podcasts for free. So, um, yep, there should be as much podcast as possible if it comes <laughs> to me. So, because that's it, it we, becomes with... That's what, how we roll. Yeah, but also like, I mean, even, you know, how many people have told me like, yeah, and then I heard Joe Rogan talking about mushrooms and I was like, hmm, I should try this. Mm -hmm. So, it really has an effect on people in a way Um just listening to a podcast more than coming from your government or from your doctors. I mean, you know, like from, from the healthcare system that is still Absolutely. very behind these things. So, I mean, yeah, the more people talk about it, the better it is, I think. Yeah, I agree. Completely agree. Uh, Jay, um, do you have any final thoughts before we ask Anne to share where people can find her and all those things? Any final I, thoughts? I'll, as always, I like to start and end with gratitude. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, Anne, for being on our show and for sharing your story and yeah. for the work that you're thank doing. You and where can our audience find more about you and yeah. what your work is and everything you're up to? Yeah, so the podcast is called The New Health Club. You can find it on Spotify, Apple mostly and on the website um the foundation is still in the making of course there will be news about this on linkedin i guess the first as the, as the first place always then the website of course is the new health club dot co at the moment um we might have to change it to nl but it <laughs> should be co and um soon we also starting april we relaunching our newsletter and uh, that's very exciting because also one of the editors is also based in New York. And we really want to turn it into a specific, almost like extra medium besides the podcast. It doesn't announce anymore just a podcast, but we will refer to retreats. We will sell products that you can buy already like Kana or like um, Sentia, the drink that David Nutt from Imperial College was designing. Wait. 
And um, so I'm very excited about that. So, but of course, um, this is in the making. And then, of course, uh, all these live events that we're doing. So I think LinkedIn will be always a great place to find these. And the newsletter, of course. And what's your, the what's your, ta just, your tag on? My, my yeah. LinkedIn is just my name, Anna Filippi. So you can, we will always post everything that is coming up as a live event. And um, yeah, but I think the podcast, these live events and... Uh, the newsletter and the foundation. So this, my aim is really to create this kind of um, little empire. <laughs> right? Yeah. This psychedelic empire. So, well, I, for one, am very excited about your New York Yeah, me too. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I can't <laughs> I wait to go back. I will be very much present. I look forward to giving you another hug. I And, uh, and I, I agree with Jay. Thank you so much Thank for being here we believe very deeply that your sharing makes a difference and so thank you're you. obviously leading in that way in the world and just thank you so much for spending your time and bringing your energy and your heart and your truth to us and to everyone listening thank you so much it was a really great conversation i really enjoyed it and also that i could be yeah thank you. more outspoken about things i really like that too such a pleasure yeah. thank you thank Ryan. you thank you Thank you, everyone, seriously, for listening, for spending your valuable, valuable time, energy, and heart with us. Every bit of it makes a difference. Yeah, thank you. We would love it if you could show your support for the show by subscribing on YouTube, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts, or follow us on Instagram. You can always click the like button, leave us a comment, or share an episode with somebody directly. Like we mentioned, every month we host integration coaching circles. So, so much good work is happening there. You are invited to join us. Go to trustthejourney.today slash integration. The Trust the Journey family includes these integration coaching circles and our private Facebook group where we connect and support each other. Join us by going to our website, trustthejourney.today and click the orange Patreon button. Yeah, thanks. It's your support and engagement that make the show possible. Thank you. We're here to connect with you. Feel free to DM us anytime on Instagram. We're at trustthejourney.today. Thank you. We love you. <laughs> we love you. Keep laughing, keep loving, and keep trusting the journey. <laughs>